Brandish up your whip and shame! Put the circus trains a blazing tail! <laughs> It's hard for us to picture the circus without envisioning the picturesque image of an old circus train. The brightly colored behemoth covered in banners and advertisements belching a cloud of smoke as it lumbers along, no doubt right on schedule to bring fun and entertainment to a nearby town. It's a nostalgic picture, a romantic one, and an ocean indelibly linked to our ideas of the early American circus. But how true to life is it? What role have trains played in the circus throughout history? Well, all aboard as we take a short trip down the history of the circus train. The first modern circuses, no, not those. Yes, those circuses were permanent theaters erected in England and the United States in the late 1700s. The brainchild of equestrian performer and businessman Philip Astley, these amphitheaters served as stage and stadium for equestrian shows and trick riding usually with clown acts and live music in between segments. These large spectacles didn't need transportation as the performers, hens, and animals could all reside in nearby lodgings or in the building itself. What did need constant means of transportation in the early embryonic days of the circus were the small itinerant shows that traveled between towns. Sometimes a couple of actors, sometimes jugglers, clowns, oddities, or even snake oil salesmen these shows moved about in wagons and carriages, plying rutted out paths and muddy trails that could barely be called roads, even in their own day. As the concept of merging all these forms of entertainment into a singular giant spectacle, a true traveling circus began to emerge. It was clear that to make it happen, new advancements in vehicular locomotion would have to be on the itinerary. Fortunately, by the early 19th century, James Watt's steam engine had been modified to power a cart on wooden or metal tracks. By the 1830s, the invention of this revolutionary new steam locomotive had heads and minds turning with the possibilities this new mode of transportation could provide. And as with any new innovation in this country, the first two interested parties would be the military and the circus. The first record we have of a show utilizing a train to transport its equipment and personnel was in 1854. In that year, a show called either the Stone Circus or the Din Stone Circus, I was unable to find a clear answer on that one, loaded their tents and animals onto a train, probably like this one. And, well, it turns out that like electric cars and rural America, the infrastructure just wasn't in place for a relationship between circuses and trains just yet. By the time the Civil War began in 1861, the amount of railroad track in the United States had increased to almost 30,000 miles. With new track and lines being added almost monthly during the war, America was becoming a country on rails. Between 1865 and 1875, even more track was laid, increasing the total amount to nearly 80,000 miles, linking every major city, as well as many smaller towns and settlements. Now at this point in history, a few shows had experimented with rail travel, renting out space in freight trains, buying a few cars to couple the trains heading the way they wanted to go, and so on. It worked fair to middling for these circuses. In so far, nobody had made a move to buy an entire train for the purpose of moving a circus. I mean, who could afford something like that? Sure, it would be cheaper just to own the livery rather than rent, but trains were prohibitively expensive. It would take some kind of crazy ultra-rich, circus-obsessed impresario to do something like that. Enter P.T. Barnum. Actually, it wasn't Barnum. It was a showman by the name of William Cameron Coop, who had partnered with Barnum's new traveling circus and the Dan Costello Circus to create a show the likes of which no one had ever seen before. The train pulled out of New Jersey in 1872, a long serpent of iron and wood that boasted specialized flat cars, dining facilities, animal cars, and everything else a circus would need on the move. This seemed to inspire other large shows to get in on the action, and by the turn of the century, most circuses who could afford it had purchased their own fleet of rail cars to transport their show across the country. By 1900, almost 40 circuses were touring America by rail, it was in this era that the image of a colorful train passing by as children watched with fascination and glee originated. A train 
painted with glorious artwork advertising the mystifying and exotic cars with gilded bars, where if you are fortunate enough, you may steal a glance of an elephant or a zebra. Children running alongside playfully as the cavalcade of merriment slows to a stop in the small rail yard of their hometown. The golden age of the circus train had finally arrived. It wasn't all spit and polished glitz and glam, though. Some circuses in the age of the train may do with what they could get. Smaller outfits operated what is known as ghillie shows, so named because they could only afford to rent out a couple of railroad flat cars and had to pack everything they needed on ghillies or wagons and cram as much as they could onto the flat cars. Imagine having to pack everything you need for a circus in the back of and on top of a van. And you have an idea of what the hustlers and roustabouts of these ghillie shows had to put up with. Though it looked as though the circus train was there to stay by 1900, by 1920 its days were becoming numbered. Despite the fact that the end of World War I had left a glut of train cars as surplus that could be bought for scrap prices by any show who desired them, a new player had entered the game. The Automobile while Barnum and Bailey Circus was buying up a small rail yard of Millsurp passenger coaches in 1923, the Downey Brothers Circus and the Seal Sterling Circus were proving that motor trucks could be used to successfully transport circus equipment and personnel over long distances. By the 30s, Tom Mix's Wild West show was traveling from coast to coast by the use of trucks. Though at first scoffed at by circus men who grew up in the age of the train and the wagon, the gas was not only earning its spot in the circus, but surpassing the train in versatility and economy. The 30s, 40s, and 50s saw more and more shows turning to the truck and abandoning the venerable old still dragons of old. Some still persisted, claiming the train is the only way to transport the massive amounts of men and material necessary for their show. Ringling Brothers and Bonham and Bailey was one of these, and in fact, still use a train, even today. With the advent of diesel-electric locomotives after World War II, the classic steam-powered locomotive became obsolete, further shattering the image of the classic circus train. Though it's difficult to chisel a date into the headstone of the circus train, it's safe to say that the Second World War marked the end of the era. After that, it seems that most circuses became truck shows, and the circus train faded into history and the imagination. So now you know a little about the history of the circus train, or at least the weather twos and why fours surrounding the mythical machines. So the next time you see a 440 locomotive pulling a long line of animal cars and colorful circus wagons, remember, you're probably looking at a model in a museum in Gibtown. Starts to overwhelm, 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 overwhelm.